The most common measure of local autocorrelation is the local Moran's I statistic. And you can tell it's a local statistic because we are going to have a different measure of I for each location. So we have I sub I. This big I is the Moran's I, the statistic, and the little I are the different locations on the map. Here we can see that the local Moran's I statistic is just a product between the deviation for point I times the sum of all the deviations in the neighborhood surrounding point I. So we're going to take the sum of all the other deviations, but only select the ones with, with positive connectivity, with a strong W value between I and J. Something that you should see is that the sum of all the local Moran's I's, if we summed up all of these statistics across all I's, then the sum of the local Moran's I is proportionately equal to the global Moran's I. So if we take the global Moran's I that we calculate for a map, we can distribute that global Moran's I into little pieces all over the map that would add up to the global Moran's I. Also, the local Moran's I statistic is normally distributed, and therefore we can find specific locations that have significant positive or negative autocorrelation, and we can map out these locations. In a typical implementation of local Moran's I, say using Esri ArcMap, Zones can be categorized into five types based on the local Moran's output. First of all, a zone might be insignificant, in which case we can conclude that that location is not part of a significant local cluster, or it's not part of any negative spatial autocorrelation pattern either. We can also have locations that are significant. So classes two through five are all locations of significant auto, local autocorrelation. The high high class are locations where xi is high and it's located with other high values. So this is a positive autocorrelation case. We can have a low low case where a value is low and it's clustered with other low values. Again, this is still an example of positive autocorrelation, because we have low with low or high with high. Or we can have low high or high low cases, where a location tends to cluster significantly with opposite types of locations. So, high, so low values are clustering with high values, and high values clustering with low values. When we compute the local Moran's I, we usually output the data using a choropleth map indicating the type of cluster at each location in the map. The gray areas on the map are locations where there's no significant spatial pattern. We see the black areas are the high with high areas. So the black areas are areas where we have a high number of English speakers surrounded by neighbors that also are high English speakers. So all of these black areas are high with high. The low with low are all of these blue areas. Those are locations where we have a lot of French speakers living close by to other French speakers. So we have all of these locations essentially being these low with low clusters. We have a few locations that are high with low. So here, here, some in here. These are locations that, are, that have high levels of English speaking inside the zones, but they're surrounded by zones that, are, that have low levels of English speakers. So these are either little English, you know, sporadic zones, pockets of historically English neighborhoods surrounded by neighborhoods that aren't English speaking. We have also a couple of cases of these low with high tracks. So these are low English tracks 
being surrounded by some high English tracks. So based on this map we can see you know it gives us a way to to really understand the spatial pattern of clustering of English speakers in the island of Montreal and it allows us to uh, include a notion of how significant the amount of clustering is at different locations which gives us an added edge when trying to describe this map pattern over and above just uh, trying to visualize the raw choropleth map that we saw earlier in the presentation.